The March Lecture Series is our annual fundraiser, our only fundraiser, and we're glad you braved the elements to join us today. I'm so pleased today to introduce my friend, colleague, Mary Jane Bradbury. A gifted storyteller, Mary Jane draws on over 25 years as an actress, speaker, educator, and author to bring history to life. She's a Chautauqua speaker for Humanities Montana and the Colorado Humanities, and has been an artist in residence for the Charles M. Russell Museum in Great Falls and the National Wildlife Museum in Jackson, Wyoming. Before leaving Colorado and moving to Montana in 2014, Mary Jane was an interpreter and actor for the Denver Museum of Nature and Science and has written and produced historic events for Four Mile Historic Park in Denver. A member of the Single Action Shooting Society, her alter ego, Alice Palmer, <laughs> enjoys spending time on the range channeling the spirit of frontier women. Mary Jane's passion for history, education, and performance merged when she created her speaking business, A View of the Past, dedicated to inspiring audiences of all ages by bringing to life compelling stories from history. She has presented her unique storytelling to schools, museums, corporations, and historic venues throughout the Rocky Mountain West. Today, Mary Jane's going to give us a little different view of a historic figure, Margaret Brown. Here's Mary Jane. Okay. <laughs> <coughs> yes, thank you so much for making your way here through the many obstacles, real or imagined, but mostly real, that are out there. I appreciate you doing that. Most of you uh, who are familiar with my work usually see me standing up here in some sort of costume, with some sort of accent or some sort of demeanor through which I'll tell the story of a, a woman from history. But today I'm going to do a little different approach with the story of Margaret Brown and sort of uh, deconstruct how it is we come to tell women's stories in history and uh, give you something to think about in terms of how we as a society uh, rely on our stories to define us. And I start out with this wonderful quote. Winston Churchill, history will be kind to me, for I intend to write it. Wouldn't it be great if we all could just write down what we want people to say about us after we're gone or even now? But that isn't how it works. And so this is really largely one of the themes of Margaret Brown's story. So Margaret, unsinkable Molly Brown, and the myth-making press. Three things here, Margaret Brown, the press, and the idea of myth. So the first one is Margaret Brown. Margaret Brown story that we're going to look at takes place in Colorado between about 1880 and 1920. She was a social, political, and labor reformer, a woman ahead of her time. She came from modest beginnings. She survived the sinking of the ocean liner Titanic and is the person upon whom the myth unsinkable Molly Brown is based. We'll get to much more about her <coughs> in a minute. Now before we get to press, um, when we think today we have input from media of all sorts in our pockets, in our hands, on the radio, on the television, uh, newspapers, we have to go back to a time, the turn of the 20th century, when newspapers were the only way, the only way to get news. And it was a really big and um, competitive uh, industry at the time. And so keep that in mind. Take away all your other ways of getting information. That was the way people got information in those days. So that's what they believed was true information. So let's start with the press. Uh, remember extra, extra, read all about it. You know, the little extra editions if some piece of news happened and everybody wanted more information and the little newsboys in the streets. Uh, newspapers were inexpensive by the turn of the 20th century. Anybody could afford one. They were ubiquitous. They were often owned by corporate entities, particularly if you know Montana's story, the Anaconda Copper Mining Company owned and uh, regulated and influenced so many of the newspapers. So the newspapers, the journalists, not only selected information that they were going to give out, but they also interpreted it. And they interpreted it largely according to the mores of the time. 
the stereotypes of the time. They interpreted according to what they thought people wanted to read, and they only picked the pieces of information that they thought fit into the stories that they could interpret about what people wanted to read. And so there was a lot of filters going on before the news actually got into people's hands. And when you look at stereotypes of the day, you look at stereotypes about women, and that's what we're talking about today, and we're talking about white, non-working class women. Not all women were created equal. There were immigrant women, women of color. Uh, they had many more obstacles to overcome, and the idea was that all women aspired to be the white, non-working class woman, have that sort of life. And that ideal woman's life and woman's image was this. A woman isn't very smart. She's emotional. <coughs> she's domesticated, or she should be domesticated. She doesn't have any need for education at all because her job is to stay home and raise children. She is not outspoken. She does not speak her mind. Uh, she's... Uh, not the hero of anything. She has to be rescued. And she's nice to look at. OK. Margaret Brown was not any of those things. <laughs> she was not particularly attractive by the standards of the day. She was outspoken. She spoke her mind on a number of issues that had to do with reform and labor and social, political issues. She continually bettered herself through travel and self-education. She came from humble beginnings, so she didn't have a formal education, but she was always bettering herself. And all of these qualities made her an easy target for the press because she was out there being very outspoken and visible at a time when women were not really supposed to be doing that. So the press made fun of her. They ridiculed her sense of fashion. They ridiculed her lack of breeding, her lack of sophistication. And that kind of set her up for what was going to come in her life. <coughs> and instead of telling the truth about her, because they didn't, it laid the groundwork for this myth of the unsinkable Molly Brown that we'll be getting to in just a minute. Now that brings us to myth. All right. <coughs> Myths and legends, ever since human beings have lived together, they have created myths or legends to explain things that seemed unexplainable to them. They had to have reasons for things. So think way back in primitive societies when <coughs> they didn't understand the weather, they didn't understand life and birth and death and illness and who got well and who didn't and why the crops grew and why they didn't. So they created entities and deities and and made stories so that would help them explain their world. And as time went on and some of those unexplainable things got explained, now there's still a need for a hero. There's still a need for somebody to look up to. There's still a need for somebody who might be able to do something in a situation that we aren't, we aren't strong enough to do or smart enough to do. So this idea of myths continue to stay with us and even even today, think of some of the iconic names. You can think of John Wayne. I mean, as a human being, he was definitely human. But the, the image of him and that heroic myth that has grown up around him, when we mention that name, we all know what we're talking about because he set a standard that inspired and directed, in some ways, generations of people. All right. So let's look at the real Margaret Brown story. We got press, we got myth, now we're going to start to combine some of these. Margaret Brown. Margaret Brown was born in 1867, just after the Civil War, in Hannibal, Missouri. Her parents were working class Irish immigrants. She knew poverty, she knew prejudice. She grew up wanting a better life, but she also worked hard. There was a large, Irish, busy, noisy family that she grew up in, and she appreciated all that humanity had to offer in those circumstances. Her brother and sister moved to Leadville, Colorado, when Margaret was a teenager, because the big Leadville silver boom was taking place there, and everybody was going to go to Leadville and get rich. So she moved from Hannibal to join them in Leadville. 
She got a job at a, a dry goods store, working in the drapery department, working with the velvets and silks, and, and still had this idea that she would better herself continually, and then met at an ice cream social, James Joseph Brown, J.J. Brown, as he was known. He uh, was not a wealthy man, but he was a mining engineer at one of the large conglomerates there in Leadville. And uh, they fell in love, and they got married. They moved into a modest little house. They had a son came first and then a daughter. And here's Margaret, after years of, of not having much of a st stable um, roof over her head or any sort of resources that she could have at her disposal, she started taking uh, lessons from tutors, art, literature, languages. She wanted to better herself. And when they finally moved to Denver, here's how that happened. Um, there was a mine that there was a big obstruction, and they couldn't get through the obstruction, so James Joseph Brown figured out a way to clear away the sand that kept caving in on this rich vein of gold. And when he finally made that solution, well, he and the company became rich overnight. And that's where her money came from. And they moved to Denver, Colorado, to a modest home. It wasn't a, a huge mansion or anything, but it was well appointed by the standards of the day. This is 1893 that they moved. It's still standing today and is a, a museum. When she got to Denver, she started a splendid social life. No, she wasn't part of the old money set, but she, she had a lot of social connections, and she began to, to be involved in a number of charities over the years, um, contributing to society in any way that she could. Her children grew up and moved on. She was on holiday in the Middle East in 1912 when she was on her way home and booked passage on the Titanic. And the Titanic sank. She survived, and then her legend began as the unsinkable Molly Brown. After the sinking of that ship, um, she used the notoriety that came with the legend that wasn't true at all <coughs> to further her activities in labor reform. She was married to a mine manager, a part of the management. That's a different animal than labor, but she always had a union card. Wherever she went, she had a union card and she spoke for the workers. She said it's the job of any capitalist to know what their workers are doing and to take care of them so that this system can be going and, and, and thriving. So she understood both sides and she was definitely planted in both sides. The money from those uh, boom strikes doesn't last forever. So as the 20s and 30s come into view, Margaret, who always loved acting, moved to New York City and spent the last several years of her life as an actress, coaching and performing. She died in 1932 at the age of 65. All right, there you have it. A sort of chronology of Margaret Brown's actual life. Now in 1935, a few years after she died, a man named Gene Fowler, a uh, man named Gene Fowler, uh, old timers from the boom camp days of Colorado, Montana, Utah, you name it, they were getting older and they decided, well, I, they're going to write down their reminiscences. Well, that was like take it with a pound of salt because most of that stuff was what they remembered and not all their memories were clear and they also wanted to tell their story. <laughs> And he wrote a book in 1935 called Timberline. And in it, there's an entire chapter devoted to Margaret Molly Brown. And here's how he told the story. As a baby, Margaret was rescued from a flooded Mississippi by Mark Twain. <laughs> she was a tomboy growing up. She gets a job as a waitress in town, and she overhears Mark Twain talking about all the riches in the West, so she decides to go West. She was so poor that her mother packed her food in a cardboard box, and when she got to Leadville, she got a job in a saloon. <laughs> then she met Leadville Johnny. He was poor at the time, but the money came in, and they were rich. They moved to Denver into a palatial home. Now, 
she was active in uh, social activities, but um, her real claim to fame was when she traveled on that Titanic, and it sank. <coughs> Boy, and when she was in that lifeboat that night, she had to use everything in her power to shore up the spirits of those women. She gave away all of her clothes, singing and telling people that it was okay, that they were going to make it, that nobody sinks when Margaret Brown is around. <laughs> she returns to, uh, to Denver afterwards, and sadly, J.J. leaves her. Her son leaves her, leaves her, and her daughter leaves her, and she dies despondent in that big old mansion. <laughs> now, it probably wouldn't have gone much further than that, Again, every, every area has its local character. So whoever read Timberline, which would mostly be Colorado people or maybe some historians over the years, they would, they would uh, read that and say, well, interesting person. But in the late 1950s, a woman named Helen Deutsch wanted to write a musical about this woman. She got a hold of that Timberline book, and then her version of it came out like this. Rescued from the flooded Colorado River and raised by an old mountain man named Seamus Tobin, <laughs> Molly Brown journeyed to Leadville, got a job in a saloon, met Johnny Brown, and they wed. He told her that he just sold his silver claim. And he came home one night with $300,000, and she was so excited that she didn't know where to store it so that it would be safe, so she put it in the stove. He went out to go celebrate with his friends, and when he came home, he lit a fire in the stove and burned all the money up. And he said, well, don't worry about it. I'll just go out and get more, which he did. They all moved to Denver. Society snubs her. No matter how hard she tries, the old moneyed set won't have anything to do with her. So she decided to travel to Europe. And there in Europe, she met European royalty. She learned languages. She learned social graces. She could speak almost any tongue there in, in Europe. But she missed, she missed Colorado, so she came home and invited all her royal friends to come with her. And then they held a great big party at which her Leadville crony friends showed up, had a big melee, and ruined the party made her into a laughing stock once again. So she returned to Europe, fell in love with a prince, missed Colorado so much that she booked passage on the Titanic so she could return home. And when she got home, JJ welcomed her with open arms. So there you have it. Now we're two, uh, we're two generations down. Repeated lies become history, but they don't necessarily become the truth. When the reviews of that movie came out, this is what was written about it. Harv Presnell, who has seen this movie, The uh, Unsinkable Molly Brown? Harv Presnell, this, uh, J.J. Brown, and Debbie Reynolds, she got an Academy Award nomination for this part. Came out in 1964. Uh, the songs are catchy. It's a body catchy romp during which Debbie Reynolds shines, rollicking across the dance floor, a red-headed dynamo in a gauzy green dress. The New York Times called the film big, brassy, bold, and freewheeling and added, the tones are ringing, but they ring hollow. Molly is a colorful character, but not an inspired one. The film's lavish, attractive production numbers make up for its shallow superficiality. Variety magazine echoed that and said, in essence, it's a pretty shallow story. Since the title character, obsessed with very superficial, egotistical problems, uh, covers up her, her generous facade. And in London, the London Times wrote, Reynolds makes brash, social climbing, both funny and touching, but the film is trapped between satire and sentimentality. Nowhere, nowhere in any of these reviews or in any of the uh, 
talk about the movie, was any of the substance of Margaret Brown's life mentioned? They're, they're going back to that stereotype of, of a boorish, social climbing immigrant woman comes from the below and gets up high, and how, who cares how she does it, in this case with a lot of singing. Here's a <laughs> picture of her in her barroom scene. It's a great movie, but it is absolute total nonsense. So let's look here at the next little bit. History is a fiction we invent to persuade ourselves that events are knowable and that life has order and direction. That's why events are reinterpreted when values change. We need new versions of history to allow for our current prejudices. And the word that jumps out here at me is prejudices. We don't maybe necessarily go to a true place, but we change the prejudice so that it is in more keeping with the status quo of our times. Prejudices around women began changing in the 1960s, just about the time this movie came out. And by the 1970s, I noticed a few people in here may have uh, experienced personally that women's lib movement, where women uh, wanted to be seen so differently. They wanted respect. They wanted to raise themselves up uh, in, the, in the workplace. They wanted to be seen as substantive people, not just quiet keep your mouth shut and don't come out. There were exceptions to this rule, of course, all along. But in general, those exceptions had to fight really hard to get where they were going. So we've got a, a shift in value. Scholarship, genuine scholarship around women's stories began to emerge in the 1970s. By the 1980s, a woman named Kirsten Iverson contacted the, the uh, descendants of Margaret Brown and said, I'd like to write a biography of your mother. And they said, no way. They'd been through all this. They had been through all this. In fact, Helen Benzinger, Margaret Brown's daughter, when she got married in Denver, she and her husband chose to live in New York, largely because of the way the Denver newspapers treated the family. She said, the false and ridiculous light they have always placed us in. We have the Denver newspapers to thank for all the nonsense, and the other newspapers only copied them. Mother, unfortunately, always seems to get the worst of their treatment and the greatest quantity of it. They love to make sport of her. Finally, Iverson was persistent and convinced the family that her look at Margaret Brown's life would not be like the run of the mill, and they let her have access to an amazing trove of documents. There were correspondence for years and years. Margaret liked writing, so she had a few essays that were there. Um, there were um, scrapbooks with photographs and all kinds of memorabilia. And Iverson pieced together the life of a woman very different from the one I've described. So let's look at Margaret Brown's real accomplishment. Remember I told you she came from poverty. She came from very humble beginnings. Her father was one of the engineers, if you will, on the Underground Railroad during the Civil War. She knew what it meant to stand up for people who needed help. When she started uh, working in Leadville, right after she was married, she started a soup kitchen and a literacy league for the miners so that they would have some fallback. It wasn't always easy being a miner, and the conditions weren't good for them. So she started that first charitable activity in Leadville. When she got to Denver, she was a charter member of the Denver Women's Clubs. Now, women's clubs in those days were the way that women, in an acceptable way, began to make inroads into education, into business, into politics. The overarching umbrella that it's a women's club made it acceptable, but there's where these women learned to organize. They learned how to uh, get out there and make changes. They organized charity events. Margaret was a substantial member of the Art and Literature Committee, and she raised money for schools. She was involved with a juvenile court reformer at the time. Juvenile offenders were put in jail with uh, hardened adult criminals, and she wanted to see a change to that. So she worked very hard and raised a lot of money 
for the efforts of this individual who was working to change those laws and who succeeded, largely because of all her passionate support. She also chaired a number of fundraisers that built St. Joseph Hospital in Denver. After the Titanic, Margaret had um, created a lot of uh, social connections in Newport, Rhode Island. Newport, Rhode Island was the place to be for society. So she was in Denver, she was in New York, Newport, and she made some pretty amazing connections with the suffrage uh, workers there. Alva uh, Vanderbilt Belmont, superbly wealthy. They worked very hard to um, work for suffrage for an eight-hour day, for minimum wage, for affordable child care. All of these were legislations that they were lobbying to have enacted. She also turned a lot of people sideways when she advocated for women in the military. She said, if we want to be equal, then that's what we should do, is be equal. So she was an early advocate for that. She started to run for the U.S. Senate in 1914. Now, she probably would have succeeded being the first woman elected to Congress, but it was 1914. The war that was going on in Europe had just started, and we were not fighting in it, but there was definitely political leanings, and eventually we would be fighting in it. And Margaret's sister was married to a German duke. So that would have been a conflict of interest. So she dropped out of the campaign and went to Paris and started the American ambulance system there, for which she was awarded the French Legion of Honor. When she went to New York for that, uh, for that wonderful acting career, and <laughs> it must have been, she was such a ham. I mean, you could, she just uh, was. She dressed outrageously. She didn't care what anybody thought of her. She, um, she was willing to say what a lot of people didn't want to say. So she really did thrive. She won awards for her acting. And... Uh, taught at the Barbizon School. So you might be going, wait a minute. This woman was over the top to begin with. So uh, maybe she, maybe this myth that came out of, of her life isn't so far off. But why doesn't that just bring us to the actual situation where the myth got started? All right, the Titanic was one of three sister ships that the White Star Line was going to build. For years, all of the, the transatlantic ships had been competing on speed. Who can get from Southampton to New York the fastest? And there was all this competition. The White Star Line decided, well, let's compete with luxury. So they decided to have three sister ships, the Olympic, the Titanic, and the Britannic. And so the Olympic had sailed, Titanic was second, and this was the ship of dreams, as they called it. They say that first class on Titanic was as opulent, I'm sorry, third class on Titanic was as opulent as some first classes on other ships. Now, it only, it only sailed for three days, so we don't have a lot of documentation, we don't have a lot of pictures. But those who survived said that the conditions were just incredible. Here is the deck, and here are the lifeboats. There was room for two rows of lifeboats, but they decided not to put two rows in because it would crowd the deck. And a picture of this grand staircase. Again, if anyone took a lot of pictures in those first three days, they're all at the bottom of the ocean. So we don't have a whole lot. I included this one to let you see how big the propeller is. Here's the people, huge propeller. Here's another one, and there was another one on the other side. It was called triple screw technology. It was state of the art to get this huge ship off and running. You can read a lot of books and see a lot of documentaries now with science and technology, knowing what it knows now, and now that they've found the debris field, under the ocean, they can piece together exactly what happened that night. So you can, you can look up all of that to your heart's content, but 
the truth is that Titanic struck an iceberg at 11.30 on the evening of April 14th, and it sank at 2.20 the morning of April 15th. Has anyone seen James Cameron's movie Titanic, the big one from the 90s? I love this scene. I love the scene. <laughs> the, the ship has hit the iceberg, and the, they're all in this room. There's the builder, Mr. Andrews. There's the Captain Smith, and there's Mr. Ismay, who was the president of the White Star Line and a couple of the first officers. And, the, and he's, uh, Andrews is going, well, the water's coming in, it's coming in, it's coming in. And the captain says, well, how long do we have? And then he looks again, and he says, well, an hour, two at the most. And Ismay, the White Star Line president, says, wait a minute, this ship can't sink. And Andrews turns around and looks at him and said, she's made of iron, sir. She can and she will. It is a mathematical certainty. So it could and it did. So what about lifeboat number six, Margaret Brown's lifeboat? What happened that night that led to this myth? Well, it was a cold night. No one wanted to dress for dinner. Uh, they wanted to just have dinner and go back to the warmth of their little cabins with the electrical heaters. And sometime around 11:30, the crew comes down the, the ramp and, and knocking on the door. Get your get your life vest and go up to the boat deck. Well, they hadn't had a drill. Everyone was kind of surprised by this in first class, of course. Uh, well, it's good they didn't have a drill because 2,200 people would have realized there were only boats for 1,200. But off she went, she put on, oh, she described later, she put on a velvet suit and 13 pairs of socks because she had frostbite on her feet back in Leadville and she did not want to get frostbite for any reason. She had a mink stole that, uh, that JJ had given her, a scarf, a life vest, and off she went to the port side of the ship. Now she got up there about quarter to one, so you know, things had been just sort of languishing for over an hour. And uh, nobody really knew what was happening, and here's uh, Mr. Murdoch, Mr. Lightholder, on the port side of the ship, and he's putting people in the boat, and so finally she says, well, I'm going to go over and see what's happening on the starboard side. So she turns to go, and someone picked her up and popped her over the side into lifeboat number six, which she said no one had practiced it going down, so it was jerking down in the lines, and finally it fell the last 12 feet into the water, splash. And there they were, 23 people in a boat fitted for 75. Row, they said, row away because if by any chance the ship could go down, there'd be a big suction. That's what everyone thought. Mostly this is an exercise. Lots of times there's problems on a ship and, and we get into the lifeboats and row away and then we have to row back and get back on after they fix what's wrong. So a lot of people didn't even want to bother getting into a lifeboat. They rowed off, first boat off of the port side of the ship. They had an hour and a half to watch the ship sink. There were no crew people to speak of in the boat. Look at these oars. These are women trying to figure out how to manage rowing the lifeboats. As soon as the ship sank, now there was no more lights. All the lights went down with the ship. So they're out there in the dark, calm sea, just like glass, icebergs all around you, as tall as buildings, people hollering out, trying to find some way to connect with other boats because if they could, the overloaded ones could share some of their passengers with the ones that hadn't been completely filled. The quartermaster, Mr. Hitchens, was in charge of lifeboat number six, and he was a craven little man, she wrote later. He, he whined and moaned that we would drift at sea for days and drown or starve. And, and uh, finally, I got so upset with him, I walked up to him and I said, keep it to yourself if that's the way you feel. For the sake of these women and children, or I'll throw you over myself. And another woman on the ship, little boat said, well, she wouldn't have had to do anything but take a step toward him and he would have fallen into the water. He was so scared. So these women, they rowed. She said, you had to keep moving because you got so perspired near your, your body <coughs> that if you didn't keep moving, you'd freeze. 
Around 3.30 in the morning, the Carpathias showed up, the rescue ship. And by that time, the seas had come up a little bit. There were a lot of waves. And so after being the first boat into the water, lifeboat number six was one of the last boats to be brought up. Where she said we shared that panicked, awful feeling of having survived when so many others perished. Over 700 people were saved and more than 1,500 perished. She wrote later, to have the, to have the power to close my ears, I could close my eyes, but for those first few minutes after the ship went down, all those people in the water. And if you're sitting in a boat three quarters of a mile away, trying to row back, it's going to be a heroic task, I bet. When she got onto the Carpathia, that's when her work really started. She knew most of the languages of those uh, survivors, many of them. So she started talking to people. She'd interview, interview here, there, see if there's some way to connect families. And a lot of connected families happened because of what happened on the Carpathia that night. Someone got off and to one boat and someone else, and they all got together. She worked very hard for that. She leaned on the first-class lady survivors and started a fund so that when they got to New York, there would be some money for the survivors. Most of those people lost everything. They didn't have families coming to retrieve them. They were coming for the first time, and they'd lost it all. She stayed on the ship for a couple of days until all of the people had a place to go. Oh, and why was she on the ship in the first place? When she got to Paris after her holiday, there was a telegram waiting for her that said, your grandson is deathly ill. Can you come right away? So she booked passage on Titanic. And when she got to New York, her brother met her at the dock and said that the child had eaten something that disagreed with him and he must die. <laughs> so there we have it. Margaret returned to, to Denver. She was, she was welcomed with open arms by the old moneyed set uh, for a luncheon. She said, boy, I wish they'd invited me to luncheon earlier for some other accomplishment than just getting on a ship that sank and I didn't. Uh, and then she went back to business as usual. Two years almost to the day after Titanic sank, there was a mining disaster at the Ludlow Mine in Colorado. The miners had been on strike for months. The militia was guarding the mine. It was winter. It had been a terrible winter. Everyone was hungry. Nobody had been paid on either side. And tempers came to a head, and there was a fire, and they burned some of the tent town. A, a 16 or 17 people perished, but among them three women and nine children. Margaret tried to stay neutral about that when she first heard about it, although she organized relief efforts in Denver to send shoes and supplies, clothing to the victims. But she was a good friend of the owner of the mine, Rockefeller. Yeah, she knew them in Newport, so she tried to stay neutral. But after she visited the mine, she realized that something had to be done. So with her union card in hand, she, uh, she traveled the country and lectured for a year against the conditions in these mines, how the owners needed to step up and start to make some uh, improvements so that <laughs> these kinds of things wouldn't continue to happen. Now, the papers didn't report that she was standing in front of the mine entrance, giving away her clothes and singing at the top of her lungs to shore up everybody's spirits. But that's the spirit of who she was. Maybe the, the details of how they told it weren't accurate and didn't really shine a light on the substance of her work. But it certainly shone a light on the spirit of who she was. And didn't that image of someone standing there <laughs> in the midst of chaos and crisis, holding people's spirits together, doing what needed to be done, not caring what anybody thinks about you, isn't that something to, to inspire and look up to? That myth hangs on. Iverson wrote, Iverson wrote storytellers 
try to bring a sense of purpose and closure to things that are hard to understand. Remember, that's what we said myths are all about, getting some kind of definition and direction around things we don't understand. And the press did its job because it set her up to be the kind of person that, that would do what wasn't acceptable and not care what anybody thought. The stories re reflect our attempts to make sense out of nonsensical situations. The way in which we, as a culture, tell our stories also reflects our fears, our phobias, and our concerns for our time. The sinking of the Titanic is an event that no amount of objective reasoning or creative imagining can adequately soothe in 1912 or any year since. The legends that grew up around certain Titanic personalities not only sought to temper the real human tragedy, but allowed us to continue to fall back on the familiar, conventional stereotypes that overruled what was happening in society at the time. There was a lot of change in those progressive years of the early 20th century. But if we could just fall back on what we were familiar with, those, those stereotypes, then maybe we could get our feet under us until the changes took place. Now we look back on those stories and understand what they say about us, both now and then. Moffat Brown, another of Margaret's great-granddaughters, wrote this. Hollywood eventually had its way with the story, injecting heavy doses of romance and flamboyance. But Margaret Brown's name lives on beyond the names of most of her contemporaries. Wherever she is, Molly is smiling and laughing robustly. She is laughing because the journalists, the historians, and the opponents who tried to snuff out her feminist legacy with outlandish stories concocted to marginalize her succeeded in doing just the opposite, portraying a character so colorful that the legend will never die. And in keeping with who she was, I'm going to let her have the last word. <coughs> I am the daughter of adventure, she wrote. I never expect a dull moment and must be prepared for any eventuality. I never know when I may go up in an airplane and come down with a crash or go motoring and climb a pole or go off on a walk in the twilight and return all mussed up in an ambulance. That's my arc, as the astrologers say. It's a good one, too, for a person who would rather make a snap out than a fade out of life. All right, Margaret Molly Brown. Uh, I would be happy to answer any questions you have. First thing, let me just tell you, Molly is not anything she would have been called in her lifetime. Molly is a diminutive of Margaret or Mary, and it's reserved for the working class. It's reserved for Molly, the, fush, the fishmonger's wife, Molly, the maid, Molly, the s seamstress. It was a, referred to a lower class person. Now, you think, well, wait a minute, Margaret came from here and went to here. Why was she worried about class? Well, when she got here, that was something she wanted to be respected for. So she maintained Maggie, her friends called her, but never Molly. And then somebody told me one time when they were working on the musical, Molly is easier to sing. So that's why they turned it into Molly. Any questions? Yes. 